Well, maybe obsession is a little strong. Let's call it intense interest. If a picture is worth a thousand words, this one is worth five books, and I scoured at least that many learning about the airplane in the illustration. This is the cockpit of the Bell X-1, drawn by Belgian-American aviation artist Jean-Luc Begin. It's been hanging on my office wall for about 15 years. He drew it in 1997 on the 50th anniversary of Chuck Yeager's historic Mach 1 flight in the Bell X-1. If you know the X-1's history, you might recognize that this is Jack Russell, the crew chief for most of the X-1 series airplanes. And this is Bell test pilot Chalmers Slick Goodland, who was famously and unfairly portrayed in the movie The Right Stuff. In the distance is the B-29 mothership that launched the early X-1s. If you really know the details, you'll see that this is not the X-1 that Chuck Yeager flew to exceed Mach 1 in 1947. Yeager's airplane was 6062. This one is 6063. Three X-1s were built for the initial test program, and this one, 6063, was the number 2 X-1. It was eventually converted into this airplane, the X-1E. After it was retired, it went on display at the NASA Armstrong facility at Edwards Air Force Base. So this panel is from this airplane. Began told me that to complete the sketch, he spent hours in the cockpit of this X-1 mock-up made for the Right Stuff movie. But it had no accurate instruments, so these details were filled in from photos provided by Slick Goodland, who even loaned the artist his helmet and a checklist. Both are sitting on the seat. And both Jean-Luc and Goodland, who died in 2005, signed my print. As a pilot and flight instructor, I've sat behind a lot of panels, and I've learned that while instruments can be an abstract of the outside world, they also offer a glimpse deep inside the airplane. Following the instruments upstream is almost as good as pulling the inspection plates to see what makes the airplane tick. So that's what we'll do in this video using both Jean-Luc's drawing and X-1 imagery from the Smithsonian. But first, why the X-1 in the first place? That story starts with this man, John Stack, and his boss, Eastman Jacobs, both of whom worked at the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, or NACA, during the 1930s. Airplanes of the day were getting fast enough to encounter locally transonic flow over some parts of the airframe, especially propellers. By World War II, they were fast enough that a phenomenon called compressibility was causing crashes, especially in the P-38 Lightning. Stack identified what he called the compressibility burble. In a dive, transonic flow caused the center of pressure of the main wing to shift aft, and the disrupted flow decreased the horizontal stabilizer's downforce, causing an abrupt tuck that was often unrecoverable. Wind tunnels then weren't quite good enough for extended research in transonic flow, so as early as 1933, Stack proposed this a research airplane devoted purely to high-speed flight. Busting Mach 1 wasn't really his goal. Filling in this gap was. He also proposed a turbojet airplane, not the rocket-powered aircraft the X-1 eventually became. That idea came from Army engineer Ezra Kotcher's work directly with Bell Aircraft, although many others were involved as well. Although the NATCA was unenthusiastic about the X-1, it did insist on two things an extensive sensor and instrument package, and a movable horizontal stabilizer. This feature would play a critical role in the x one success. Transonic wind data was almost non-existent, so Bell relied on firearms ballistic performance for the X-1's aerodynamics. The ballisticians couldn't offer much transonic data either, but they knew that the audible shape of a Browning 50 caliber machine gun round yielded stable, predictable trajectories. So that's what Bell used. The fit is close, even if the BMG round is a tad faster. Of course, a 50 cal round is stabilized by the spin from the barrel's rifling, and it doesn't have wings and a tail. So Bell did something extraordinary. It engineered the X-1 for an 18G ultimate load, more than twice that of the typical World War II fighter like the P-38. For a sense of how overbuilt the X-1 was, get a load of these aileron hinges. They'd be at home on a bank vault. 
They are also equipped with flutter dampers. Even without transonic data, Stack and Bell understood that the thickness of the wing governed critical Mach number. That's the lowest Mach value where at least some of the flow over the wing accelerates to sonic speed but doesn't exceed Mach 1. The thicker the wing is, the lower the critical Mach number. With transonic flight in mind, Stack proposed a 12% wing. Others at the NACA wanted 6% and they eventually compromised on two wing sets for the X-1s, one at 10% and one at 8%. To keep the shockwave from impinging on the main wing and the horizontal stabe simultaneously, Bell gave the X-1 a thinner tail. 6% was used with the 8% wing. These wings, by the way, were very difficult to construct. The 8% wing was barely 5 inches thick at the root, and it had to accommodate plumbing for more than 200 pressure sensors in the left wing alone. To meet the 18G structural load, the skins were machined from solid billets and are a half inch thick at the root. It was known that exceeding Mach 1 would require heroic power, and some believe the drag would increase infinitely, making the barrier elusive. Bell picked this engine, the XLR-11 rocket motor, which evolved from World War II JATO rockets. A company called Reaction Motors Incorporated built it. It had 6,000 pounds of thrust from four chambers. They couldn't be throttled, but they could be switched on individually. By modern standards, that's a piddling amount of thrust, less than a quarter of what the F-35 fighter has. But at just over 12,000 pounds, fully fueled, the X-1 was relatively light, and as fuel burned off, it could approach a 1 to 1 thrust to weight ratio. Bell had initially planned to feed the engine fuel and oxidizer with a turbo pump. Turbo pumps are just honking big fuel pumps, but they are the great unsung heroes of the rocket age and maybe even of Western civilization. This turbo pump from the Apollo era Saturn V booster could pump 42,000 gallons a minute, enough to fill my swimming pool in 20 seconds. The turbo pump for the X-1 was rather smaller but worked on the same principle. A gas generator fed by hydrogen peroxide passed over a magnesium dioxide catalyst produced steam that drove a turbine in a pump with two chambers, one side for fuel, one for oxidizer. Reaction Motors was late with the engine and way late with the turbo pump, which wasn't available until 1951, four years after Jaeger's Mach 1 flight. It turns out liquid oxygen is not to be trifled with, and with the help of GE, it took RMI five years to keep the pumps from exploding. Bell's workaround was what became known as a pressurized engine. They used high-pressure nitrogen to pressurize both fuel and LOX tanks to feed the engine. Elegant solution, yes, but it had problems. One, to contain the pressure, propellant tanks had to be spherical, not the cylindrical shape proposed for the turbo pump version. Spherical tanks were heavier and less space efficient. That reduced fuel capacity and burn time, reducing both speed and altitude capability. It also meant the original X-1 might struggle to Mach 1 and would never reach Mach 2. Second, the X-1s were so densely packed with stuff that to carry sufficient nitrogen, Bell had to scatter the N2 tanks, which were also spherical and also heavy, all over the airplane, a dozen of them altogether. This required a lot of piping in an airplane squeezed for space, and it's why the X-1 has these little blisters on the nose to make room for the pitot tube piping to snake around a nitrogen tank in the nose, it's also why the airframe has the dorsal and ventral channels to make space for cables, wiring, and piping. The piping was welded stainless steel, but leaks were a problem, and quite a few flights were aborted for lack of nitrogen pressure. And we're talking about a lot of pressure, 4,500 PSI. This wasn't available commercially, so Bell developed a nitrogen evaporation system to produce it. That's what this big sphere is for, to boil nitrogen at ambient temperature to increase its pressure. The tank walls were three inches thick. Here's a wide view showing how short and narrow the cockpit was. 
Bell designed an odd H-shaped yoke because they expected the pilot to encounter significant buffeting. While that did happen, it wasn't violent enough to require rodeo grips. Other than a head pad, the X-1 cockpit had zero creature comforts, not even a seat pad. Jaeger sat on his parachute, but all the pilots agreed there was little chance of bailing out of the X-1 because that sharp wing was right behind the door. You'll notice the instruments are not laid out in the standard T configuration we're familiar with today. That wasn't really a thing in the 1940s. And because this was a research airplane, the speed instruments, airspeed and Mach meter, are at the top of the stack. The airspeed indicator has an expanded scale, meaning it clicks off 100 miles per hour for every rotation. The Mach meter in 6062 is not the original. Its limit is 1.5 Mach compared to Mach 1 in Jean-Luc's drawing of 6063, the second X1. Mach number is the ratio between local airspeed and the local speed of sound. It is not the actual speed of sound. In modern aircraft, it's calculated and displayed by the air data system. But the X1's Mach meter was an analog mechanical instrument and used a pair of aneroids and some clever linkage to display indicated Mach not corrected for temperature. On Jaeger's flights, the official speed was calculated by ground radar tracking. 6062's altimeter appears to be a standard sensitive altimeter with a thousands counter but no ten thousands drum or needle. This may not be the actual operational altimeter, but it's what the Smithsonian was given. In any case, the altitude was telemetered to a ground station. You'll recognize this is a standard plain vanilla attitude indicator, or at least standard for the 1940s. It's a pressure instrument, not a vacuum gyro, and it was powered by the compressed nitrogen bell used for everything. This gauge monitors the source pressure for the entire nitrogen system. Of course, the X-1 was never intended to fly on instruments, just in the clear air above the California high desert. So why does it even need an attitude indicator? It was actually added after the initial flight tests at Pine Castle, Florida, which is now Orlando International Airport. There are several reasons for this. Flight tests require specific pitch values, and the pilot would need a reference for that since the airplane had minimal outside sight picture. That's the same reason the airplane has a G-meter. Tests had to be done at specific G-loads, and loading affected things like engine operation and control feedback. Also, drawing back, you can see the view over the X-1's nose is poor. All of the pilots struggled with this. Worse was windshield icing. Bell anticipated this, and they were right. Sitting in front of 311 gallons of minus 297 degree liquid oxygen, the cockpit was a deep freeze. For the climb to drop altitude, it had a heat and pressure feed from the B-29, but this was minimally effective. Bell installed windshield defrosting fluid, glycol at first, isopropyl alcohol later, and if you look closely, you'll see that John Luke's scalpel-like pen caught the word Lunkenheimer on the plunger. That's the same part used as a fuel primer in my cub. Still, the X-1 was landed with a completely frosted over windshield several times. Jaeger did it, and so did Scott Crossfield. They were deftly talked down by a chase pilot. At an approach speed of 190 miles per hour plus, according to Jaeger's notes, think about doing that with no outside reference. Even with a clear windshield, the X-1 was a bit of a bitch to land. At slow airspeed nearing the stall, the elevator gave up abruptly, slamming the nose down. At least six landings in the X-1s ended up this way, with a broken nose wheel. The panel had a cabin altimeter here to confirm pressurization. The X-1 had a 3 psi cabin compared to about 9 to 11 psi for a modern airliner. This was done less for physiological reasons than for inerting to protect against fire and fume intrusion. The X-1 had a single oxygen system with a demand mask, and at the highest altitudes the X-1 initially flew, pilots would have been pressure breathing, meaning the oxygen is forced into the mask and the lungs at pressure, requiring real exertion to exhale against it. Soon after testing started and pilots flew the X-1 series above the Armstrong line, they wore partial pressure suits. 
Before that, Jaeger reported that pilots sometimes returned from flights groggy from poor oxygen flow. On the X-1 panel, this device, called a blinker, was standard World War II tech to confirm oxygen flow. If it wasn't bleaking, the pilot suit wouldn't be either. X-1 pilots were busy managing the airplane's engine, and that's what these instruments are for. They include combustion chamber pressure, fuel tank and LOX pressure, and fuel and LOX quantity. In the airplane, the pilot had to manage the nitrogen pressure with this panel on the left side of the cockpit. And yes, Jaeger left his signature inside the cockpit several times during his many visits to the Smithsonian. The nitrogen pressure was stepped down in three stages, and in addition to pressurizing the propellants and the cabin, it was used to blow the landing gear down and operate the trim and flap motors. These buttons labeled spill are panic buttons of a sort. If pressure to the locks and fuel tanks ran away from the regulators, the spill buttons would dump it before the tanks exploded, and they would explode. This switch vented the attitude gyro's nitrogen to the cabin, and that's how the pressurization worked. While fiddling with the nitrogen regulators, these three gauges loom large in the pilot scan. The propellant tanks had to be at least 325 psi to feed against the 220 psi chamber pressure in the engine. If it fell too low, the propellant wouldn't feed and the engine would flame out. That was a bad thing because it could lead to fires, and 6062 suffered fires. A lot of fires. And at least one explosion violent enough to blow a chamber off the engine and rendering the rudder unusable. Nitrogen was also critical for one other task, jettisoning fuel. That's what's happening in this clip. Before every X-1 drop, the pilot would test jettison, and the chase pilot would confirm it. It was normal to jettison all the fuel if the engine didn't light or the B-29 had to land with the X-1. They tried to avoid this given the minimal ground clearance, but it could be done if necessary. The combined propellant gauge here was in percent remaining. On the ride to altitude, typically 20,000 feet, the locks would boil off, but as the program advanced, it could be topped off from the supply in the B-29. Total burn time was about two and a half minutes for the pressurized engine version, but over four minutes in the turbopump airplane. The XLR-11's four chambers were fired individually using these switches. They're arming switches that ready the fuel and igniters. Then the pilot could select individual chambers on the yoke switch. The panel had a prominent fire warning light, and Jaeger's persistent worry about fire was justified. Of the seven first and second generation X-1s built, three were lost to explosions or fire, one of which took the EB-50 launch airplane with it on the ground. All were caused by Ulmer leather gaskets, which became explosively brittle when exposed to liquid oxygen. One important instrument on the panel is also one of the least conspicuous. It's the stabilizer position indicator. The NACA had insisted that the X-1 have a moving or variable incident stabilizer to provide more control during transonic flight. The idea may have originated with this airplane, the British-designed Miles M-52 supersonic research aircraft that was abandoned just after World War II. The U.S. obtained its design details during the war. Setting the stave correctly was a critical checklist item. See it here on Goodland's list. Because the X-1 was launched from the B-29 in a shallow dive and its stall speed was 225 miles per hour at max weight, the nose had to be pitched down on release. The payoff for the moving stave came when the X-1's serial flights reached 0.94 Mach. Jaeger lost elevator control because the shock wave was impinging at the elevator hinge line. At this juncture, X-1 project engineer Jack Ridley, that's him on the right with Jaeger, proposed using the all-moving stabilizer itself for pitch control by adding a faster-acting motor and a linkage. The lore is that Ridley, who called the sound barrier the unknown, bought a hardware store motor and switch to do this, but the record suggests the X-1 was returned to Wright-Patterson for this modification. And that leads to this mystery. What is this thing? 
It's located on the lower panel under the gear indicators and in front of the stick. It took some doing to find out, but thanks to John Anderson, who built an X1 replica panel for clarifying it. It's a potentiometer for fine setting the horizontal stabilizer. The stab was moved by a nitrogen powered motor that was electrically controlled, probably turning the knob counterclockwise commanded pitch up, clockwise pitch down, and hiding over here on the far left side of the panel just above the oxygen regulator and looking like the modification it probably is, is an emergency switch for disabling the stabilizer. In other words, runaway trim protection. That the stave worked for pitch control through the transonic region is carved into history. On October 14, 1947, at 42,000 feet, Jaeger reached Mach 1.05 on three chambers. It's possible that he wasn't really the first pilot to do this, but he was the first to do it in level flight. And one other thing, he had the pictures. This is the famous paper trace of the X-1 so-called mock jump, taken directly from the NACA data recorders. This illustrates what is occasionally lost on those of us who look at the X-1's achievement as merely breaking the sound barrier. Hard stop, end of story, right? But the sound barrier was always a false construct, even if it was embraced by some pilots and engineers. It was in some way a demon of the wind tunnel. The X-1's lasting achievement was that it represented the first pure research airplane intended to collect the masses of accurate flight data that would come to define rapid aeronautical progress. Mach 1 was just one stop on the butts line that eventually led here and then here. By 1940 standards, the X-1 had a sophisticated instrument package and direct telemetry for airspeed altitude G-loading, and aileron and elevator position. It had 400 pressure orifices on wing and tail surfaces, wheel force recording, side slip angle, and a 12-channel strain gauge, among many sensors. It rapidly filled in the unknowns in John Stack's transonic gap. In various iterations, the X-1s continued flying until 1958, buttressed by other more capable X-planes, in a trend that continues yet today. Jaeger last flew 6062 in 1950 for a movie called Jet Pilot starring John Wayne. This movie is so exquisitely horrible, you owe yourself the effort to find it streaming somewhere. It at least has some terrific air-to-air -air footage of early jet fighters. Meanwhile, 6062 resides in a place of honor in the Air and Space Museum Hall of Milestones, which is currently closed due to the COVID pandemic, but it's being remodeled. But it didn't always look this way, and there's an interesting story behind it. When the X-1 arrived at the Smithsonian in 1950, it looked like this, painted partially white for the movie. It was displayed that way for years. Every October, Chuck Yeager visited the museum to speak about his exploits and finally asked then-director Don Lopez, also a World War II pilot and a flight test pilot, when the museum was going to fix the paint. So they put a guy on a cherry picker and painted over the white with a paint roller. And to this day, the X-1 looks pretty good for as close to it as you can get. You can see it when the museum reopens. And if you're on the West Coast, the San Diego Air and Space Museum has its own X-1 replica, including an instrument panel. My thanks to Bob Vanderlinden at the Smithsonian and Kristen Gelzer at the NASA Armstrong Center for help in researching this video. And look for a profile on Jean-Luc Bagan's aviation art in a future video. For AvWeb, I'm Paul Bertarelli. Thanks for watching.